the first kind of, uh, if you want to call it post-COVID gatherings, where we had a, both a, a pretty substantial crowd in our uh, seminar room, as well as uh, I think there were something like uh, 20 or more people who uh, indicated that they at least were registered for our seminar uh, today. And I see on that list uh, uh, people who may be familiar to a number of you, Tom Countryman and Elaine White, so we'll see if they in fact join us. Uh, and I see Sig Hecker just uh, on the screen here. Uh, in any case, I think that's probably a testament to our speaker today, Ambassador Alexander Clement. I'm just getting those. <laughs> <laughs> a name that should be very familiar to, uh, you know, to all of you. I think most of you are aware that uh, he serves as the director of the Disarmament, Arms Control, and Nonproliferation Department. Uh, at the Austrian uh, Ministry of Foreign Affairs. It's actually, a, I think, a, a slightly different title that I can never quite get right, but for all practical purposes, it is uh, uh, the uh, Ministry of, of Foreign Affairs. Uh, he also served as the president of the first uh, conference uh, of states' parties to the treaty on the prohibition of nuclear weapons, the TPNW. He's been very actively engaged in arms control and disarmament matters for many years, uh, both as an ambassador and also uh, when he was associated with the uh, CTBTO. Uh, he also is a scholar. Uh, and I'm pleased to uh, display a book which I guard very carefully because it costs a fortune. Yeah. Uh, uh, but nonetheless, uh, some of you, I think, have purchased it. And I'm sure Alex Alexander would sign it if you are so uh, so inclined, which is really the definitive account of the negotiation of the, the TPNW. Uh, another major accomplishment was when he was selected as the person of the year for the Arms Control Association. Uh, but I'm not going to um, uh, provide you with more background about Alexander, other than to say that uh, he is also a, a, a great friend personally and also to our uh, office in Vienna, the Vienna Center for Disarmament and Nonproliferation. So we're really grateful uh, to uh, be associated with Alexander and to welcome him back to Monterey. I should also note that next week he will be traveling on to Mexico City with Jean Dupree, where we have our annual summer school on disarmament and nonproliferation. So we're getting double duty from uh, Alexander. And so I turn the floor over to you, sir. Thank you very much, uh, Bill. Um, it's great to be back at CNS. I was here in 2013, I think, uh, and, and it's, it's really good to be back here. Uh, thanks a lot for the many years now of really very close and excellent cooperation. Specifically, the center in Vienna really has changed the scene in Vienna uh, for the better. I think it's, it's, uh, it's, it's been a really fantastic contribution to the discourse uh, in Vienna, a venue to have, uh, um, have uh, meetings, a venue for capacity building, which is really important because there are many developing countries mostly who are, uh, uh, whose diplomats in Vienna do not necessarily have a background on nuclear issues. And then they are suddenly expected to be experts on uh, uh, IAA matters or CTBTO matters. So the center really does uh, uh, fantastic capacity building and it's really been one of the one of the most sustainable and successful projects the Austrian Foreign Ministry did that we um, started this joint venture um, now 13 years ago. Um, it was opened in early 2011. That's right. But, uh, That's right. The whole negotiations was from 2010 onwards. It was an offer that was made uh, at the NPT review conference in 2010. So really, really great uh, uh, to work together. And of course, the, the uh, fringe benefit of it is that I can travel to Monterey. And, and uh, so it's really nice. Um, I was in Washington last month. Uh, I was invited by the Arms Control Association to speak uh, at the same uh, meeting, the annual meeting where Jake Sullivan made his uh, important policy speech. Uh, and it was really, it was a great uh, pleasure and honor because Darren Kimball invited me as the sort of other keynote speaker, uh, <laughs> which of course is, 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 uh, is uh, quite a tall order to be the sort of 
counterweight to the U.S. National Security Advisor, which of course I wasn't, but uh, but uh, still it was a fantastic opportunity for me to speak to the Washington crowd and and uh, specifically for an Austrian diplomat to speak to the um, sort of center of the nuclear weapons debate and 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 bring in uh, bring in a perspective. Um, and being there, it was again striking for me to see the kind of disconnect or the different types of discourses that exist on nuclear weapons, because I work in the multilateral field. I'm uh, an uh, Austrian representative in the, in the, in the um, NPT meetings, in the CTPT, in the IEA. Uh, we have delegations sitting in the Conference on Disarmament and so on. So there's the multilateral discourse on nuclear weapons, which of course the benefit of it is that it's uh, open to all states uh, and all states uh, have a say and all states have a stake in it. And the debate in Washington was of course entirely different. It's, 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 uh, it's, uh, it's extremely dominated. When I told my colleagues about the trip in Washington, I said it's China, 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 Russia, China, China, Russia, <laughs> DPRK, Iran, China, China, China. <laughs> um, so it's an entirely different, uh, it's an entirely different um, type of debate uh, there. Uh, so it's of course, nuclear weapons are a national security issue for the US, um, very clear. Uh, dominated by bilateral relationships with other nuclear weapon states and strategic relations with other nuclear weapon states. Uh, I think the focus on the multilateral regime where, where I am and where most other states uh, take part is very limited or is much more limited or definitely dominated by the bilateral uh, and national security perspective. But the vast majority of states, I mean, it's over 150 states of the 193 UN member states. There's actually more, it's 196, I think. Uh, anyway, over 150 of those states do not have nuclear weapons and do not rely on nuclear weapons uh, for their national security. Um, so they look at this issue as an existential risk to humanity. So you have the national security perspective on the one hand, and the vast majority of states look at it as a existential issue on a par with climate change, on a par with the pandemic, and would like to have a solution that takes into account common security, uh, multilateralism. Um, so it's a different, it's a different set of approach. So I thought for my talk here, I would uh, I would sort of try to do the same thing what I did in Washington is to try to. Um, bring in what I think is the perspective of the vast majority of states. Of course, I have no, no sort of mandate to speak on behalf of everybody else, but uh, I've been, as Bill knows, I've been uh, around for a long time. So I think I have a fairly good grasp of where the vast majority of countries come from. And I think it might be, it might be interesting, uh, or I hope it might be um, interesting to you. And I think it's also important to make these points more in the US because against the larger background of uh, what's happening in the world and uh, still obviously required US leadership on many issues, it's really important that this perspective is taken more into account and is more, is more appreciated um, uh, here in the US as well. So, um, so I will try to make a few broader points and then of course I look forward to the discussion. Uh, specifically, if you have comments or questions on the TPNW, which I'm only touching in my remarks in a more in a more broader uh, stroke. So the perspective that I'm talking about is essentially um, one of 150 plus countries, but it's definitely goes beyond those countries that have so far signed or ratified the Treaty on the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons. It's uh, bigger than uh, it's it's the 150, uh, 125 countries that vote for the resolution on the TPNW and the General Assembly. And again, at the, at the last NPT review conference, uh, um, 150 countries co-signed a joint statement expressing uh, their concern about the humanitarian consequences of nuclear weapons, which of course is, the, is essentially um, a, sh a shorthand for the concern about the existential risks to all humanity that nuclear weapons represents. So it's a perspective of, of concern. 
that uh, nearly eight decades, the nuclear sword of Damocles uh, still hangs above humanity and uh, still poses existential threats to the entire international community. It's, it's also concerned that there is unfortunately an apparent inability of nuclear armed states to extract themselves from this paradigm that relies on nuclear weapons and, uh, and on the threat of mass destruction. And it's also based on, on, the, on the increasing scientific research and facts about uh, what actually happens if nuclear weapons are used, meaning what happens if the nuclear deterrence paradigm fails. Um, the facts about the grave, um, very complex and global humanitarian impact if nuclear weapons are used, if there is a nuclear conflict or an accident, and about the risks uh, related or associated with the possession of nuclear weapons and the practice of nuclear deterrence. And uh, I think it's a perspective that is based on profound arguments and it's profound security arguments with which one can of course disagree, but it's not, it's not a naive approach. It's, it's based on a serious uh, set of arguments. But it's nevertheless mostly disregarded, as I said. It's, uh, the nuclear weapons discourse is dominated by other countries and other considerations, uh, um, geopolitical interests and strategic relations between the major military powers. But there is a huge nuclear weapons debate out there that goes beyond um, these considerations. What we've seen as a result of this is an increasing disenfranchisement uh, by vast part of the international community on the nuclear weapons status quo, um, and a sense of, in sense of injustice about the nuclear status quo and the treaty regime that, that we have, which is not, uh, not uh, working in the sense of uh, moving us away from nuclear weapons. Reliance. And there comes the TPNW, the Treaty on the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons, which should be understood as non-nuclear weapon states um, trying to regain some agency and to democratize the nuclear weapons discourse um, and agency on this existential issue. So the status quo, I mean, you are all experts on this. I don't tell you anything new here, I guess, but the risk, uh, nuclear risks have been on the rise long before uh, President Putin um, invaded Ukraine and <laughs> made his uh, implicit but unmistakable nuclear threats. And of course, you all know that we have many or several nuclear armed states. We have several geopolitical hotspots with the potential of escalating to nuclear conflict. We have arms race dynamics uh, accelerating, um, new technologies compound nuclear risk. So the whole picture, we have massive modernization programs, investment programs uh, into nuclear weapons infrastructure. So um, these risks are high and have been getting higher for, for a while. But of course, this already very disconcerting state of affairs was of course dramatically compounded by Russia's um, uh, invasion of Ukraine and the nuclear threats and the irresponsible uh, rhetoric that, uh, that uh, uh, Putin and others have made with respect to nuclear weapons. So there is a heightened risk for nuclear escalation in the war of Ukraine. And at the same time, we hear talk about the use of tactical nuclear weapons uh, as if this would somehow be not such a bad thing. Uh, so there is a at least I perceive an increasing risk of normalization of nuclear weapons use, which is, uh, uh, which is very bad, of course, it, and it makes the taboo against use of nuclear weapons look increasingly fragile. But of course, you also know that the famous doomsday clock, uh, which goes back to, the, to 1947, and Albert Einstein stands at 90 seconds before midnight, which is the closest it's ever been since the clock was started. So we are in a in a very dangerous situation when it comes to nuclear weapons. And the vast majority of non-nuclear states that I was talking about watches in disbelief how geopolitics slide the world back into a phase of high risk of nuclear conflict. Uh, 
So I would say that we are in a, at, at, a, at an inflection point, a fork in the road, where we see on the one hand, we see um, a re-emphasis on nuclear weapons uh, and uh, more importance being given to nuclear Terence, as a result of the crisis in uh, in Ukraine, we see that uh, we see this debate very clearly in Europe. Uh, all the situation in China, we see this debate in Japan, in in uh, uh, in South Korea. So a stronger emphasis on nuclear weapons, um, and I think this like, likely takes us down a path of more competition and new nuclear arms races, and of course increasing proliferation pressures and exponentially rising nuclear risks. And that's what I think is very disconcerting for the majority of states who um, would certainly hope that maybe this moment of heightened risks and dangers would lead finally to more political momentum to draw an alternative conclusion, which is that uh, we should uh, understand the, fra the fragility of nuclear deterrence and the ultimate unsustainability of this paradigm, that uh, nuclear further nuclear arms race must be avoided, and that the situation in Ukraine is so much more dangerous because of the uh, presence of nuclear weapons there, and that we should understand uh, more the, uns the unsustainability of the nuclear status quo, and that we should look for a paradigm shift, and the paradigm shift that we would like to see is, of course, uh, based on two aspects, would be one, critically reassessing the veracity of the arguments that underpin nuclear deterrence, and secondly, weighing these arguments against the empirical evidence that we have on the humanitarian consequences and risk of nuclear weapons. I think this is what the majority of non-nuclear states is demanding, and what is now encapsulated in the TPNW. So nuclear deterrence requires, of course, the capability of imposing unacceptable risks. And at the same time, it requires the resolve to do this, the resolve to use nuclear weapons. So without the belief in the resolve to do this, nuclear deterrence theory doesn't work. But of course, we have an assumption that the threat will suffice to deter and that escalation and conflict will be avoided. This means that in, in short, the more credible the threat of nuclear weapons use is, the more we assume the non-use of nuclear weapons, which leads to what was called the crazy reality that nuclear deterrence is a scheme for making war less probable by making it more probable. And even if we look at the horrendous concept of mutually assured destruction, which if we think about it is actually something completely incomprehensible and unacceptable, but it is used in the abstract and it's constructed as an argument of validation for nuclear deterrence and its assumed outcome, namely deterrence stability and the non-use of nuclear weapons. Nuclear deterrence is seen as the ultimate security guarantee. It's believed to have prevented nuclear conflict for the past decades. And it's believed to do this in the current circumstances in China or in uh, Russia, and to do this in the foreseeable future. And this is extremely entrenched. And I saw this very much in Washington. And nothing, nothing must challenge this belief system. But we actually don't have hard evidence. We lack the hard empirical evidence for it. It's a theory, ultimately. And it assumes and projects actions, intentions, consequences, and expected outcomes. So we can't prove that nuclear deterrence has worked in the past or that it will work in the future, just as much as we cannot prove the opposite, namely that it hasn't prevented conflict in the past or will not do so in the future. And even if we have a clear nuclear deterrence success in inverted commas in a particular crisis, this is no proof that it would work again in another different scenario, different context. So it's a belief system, and it's been called a belief system, and it depends on assumptions and it carries within it the risk of overconfidence and potential confirmation bias. 
of course, with the risk of extremely severe consequences. But by contrast to the belief system, we have a lot of empirical evidence and a growing body of research on the broad range of humanitarian consequences of nuclear weapons if they are used, and of the risks of accidents, of miscalculations, of human error, of technical error. So the research that I've seen, and I've looked uh, at this in great detail over the past years, the research that I've seen concludes that the consequences are graver than previously assumed, that they are more complex and that they are more likely global. We just have to look at what happened in the pandemic, how interconnected and interrelated everything is. And it was a light pandemic and it pales in comparison to what the nuclear conflict would cause. The same goes for nuclear risks. All experts that I've seen and heard are concerned about increasing nuclear risks. No one says these risks are diminishing, quite the opposite. Um, so they're concerned about the risks, about the difficulties of actually understanding them and the impossibility of ultimately controlling them. Of course, even the most ardent supporters of nuclear deterrence are very concerned about uh, the impact of some of the new technologies, what that will bring to, um, to this calculation. So the argument that I would make is that would it not be prudent to base policy decisions regarding nuclear weapons primarily on where we have empirical facts, on these empirical facts, and less on the assumptions that underpin nuclear deterrence that are fraught ultimately with uncertainties? So the effectiveness of nuclear deterrence is uncertain, but we know for sure that nuclear deterrence can fail. And we know for sure that if it fails, we do have the evidence that it likely fails catastrophically and that it would likely have global impact. So the whole world, including those 150 plus countries, carry the risks of nuclear deterrence failing. It brings high risks to the security of all other countries as well whose populations would end up as collateral damage in much more severe ways than previously understood. And this raises, of course, very profound legal questions, ethical questions, legitimacy questions, and international justice and intergenerational justice questions. So if we look at the situation like with Russia, what are we supposed to do with um, these kind of threats. So we have an unlawful aggression by a nuclear weapon state that is a permanent member of the Security Council and the depository of the NPT that uses nuclear blackmail as a cover of its actions. So obviously it's extremely important that that does not end up being successful. Because there are many unacceptable results if that would be the case, but on the nuclear weapons sphere, I would say it would profoundly damage any notion of nuclear restraint, and it would create a massive proliferation incentive. So I think it was laudable that NATO has responded with restraint, has not engaged in an equal uh, nuclear, strident nuclear uh, rhetoric but I think equally important is the focus on non-nuclear deterrence, which we've seen, uh, which I think is extremely important and correct. Uh, the set of economic sanctions previously never seen before and efforts to rally the international uh, community around or against Russia's actions and in support of Ukraine. And of course, there we see that that hasn't been so successful. It has been successful to some extent, but I think it raises a lot of important questions for the West, why it hasn't been more successful. But nevertheless, even though NATO has not sort of overplayed the nuclear card, um, the nuclear deterrence aspect still plays a big role in NATO's response to Russia. And of course, that's an understandable reaction. And uh, in Europe, the, 
debate is very much dominated by, by this issue and people are genuinely scared. So it's an understandable reaction in the face of, of, uh, of Russia's aggression and uh, uh, clear breaches of international law. But the point I wanted to make, and I think this is the perspective of, of, uh, that is broadly shared by many states, is that even though the nuclear deterrence aspect hasn't been overly highlighted, it still plays an important role. And this response as well compounds and perpetuates, perpetuates nuclear risks. This response is, of course, also logically based on the resolve to use nuclear weapons with the risk of global humanitarian consequences and gravest violation of international law. So the fact that this stance is based, as I said before, on the assumption that nuclear weapons will not be used and that nuclear deterrence will hold, doesn't change that. It is based on the readiness to also use nuclear weapons. And I think for the non-nuclear majority, this goes to the core of the legitimacy deficit uh, around nuclear deterrence practices. Because are there any nuclear threats that are responsible in light of what we know today about the humanitarian consequences and risks of these weapons? What, what in terms of humanitarian consequences can be considered as acceptable and especially for whom? And what's the legitimacy of taking this decision? And what kind of security and security for whom are we actually talking about in this context? So an approach that says my nuclear threat is responsible while your nuclear threat is irresponsible is not convincing from this perspective. If we look at Russia's nuclear threats, of course they are irresponsible and unacceptable. And there's certainly a more or less responsible behavior of different actors within the nuclear weapons paradigm. But non-nuclear weapon states are looking at the increasing empirical evidence on the consequences and risks and conclude that these risks and consequences make the nuclear deterrence paradigm as such an unsustainable approach. And that is ultimately irresponsible in itself and a high risk bet that is based on an, on an illusion of security, or at least of a high risk of confirmation bias on an illusion of security. So at this very dangerous moment of nuclear risks and in the face of Russia's aggression, how could the international community be united on this? Um, and it should really be united. It should be united in reinforcing the taboo against the use or threat of use <coughs> of nuclear weapons first. Secondly, to take all actions to reduce nuclear risks. And thirdly, to recommit to the nuclear disarmament and non-proliferation regime and to the goal of a world without nuclear weapons. But of course, we see as well that the entrenched reliance and belief on nuclear deterrence creates an inherent tension and difficulty to take these three steps in a credible way. On the nuclear taboo, the states parties of the TPNW last year have done their share to reinforce the taboo. And that was actually a very intensive uh, negotiations, uh, which was a big challenge for me last, last year. Um, but they've done their part to express clearly their condemnation about any use or threat of use. And in the joint declaration that I was just referring to, they, they stated, um, I quote, we are alarmed and dismayed by threats to use nuclear weapons and increasingly strident nuclear rhetoric. We stress that any use or threat of use of nuclear weapons is a violation of international law, including the Charter of the United Nations. And we condemn unequivocally any and all nuclear threats, whether they be explicit or implicit and irrespective of the circumstances. So that was the language that the TPNW states parties agreed to. I think it's the clearest and most unequivocal internationally agreed statement on this issue to date to solidify the taboo against nuclear weapons. 
We had last September, the G20 had an interesting discussion on this issue and took another important step. It stated in its joint communique, um, and it's interesting, it took place in Bali. So the pen holder was Indonesia, which is a supporter of the TPNW. Brazil is a member, Mexico is a member, a couple of other countries of the TPNW as well, who looked at the TPNW language and wanted to have something similar. And of course, you have the nuclear weapon states in the G20, and it's very difficult to do that. But what the G20 ended up saying is it stated, I quote, short and sweet, the use or threat of use of nuclear weapons is inadmissible. And inadmissible is, of course, a very interesting uh, word if you're familiar with diplomatic negotiations. Uh, it's obviously not, obviously wasn't the first idea. Obviously, it's a compromise uh, from unacceptable to inadmissible. Uh, but it's still a very strong standalone sentence, and it's obviously a compromise between those who wanted to be as unequivocal as in the TPNW and those who wanted to condemn only the actions of Russia. Now we look at the G G7 <coughs> statement uh, recently, which, which walks the condemnation of nuclear threats back significantly compared to the G20. So rightly, of course, it's Russia's irresponsible actions and policy that are condemned, but overall it's actually a joint statement in support of and conditioned by nuclear deterrence. So there is a tension between nuclear deterrence policies and the perceived <coughs> imperative to continue with the nuclear deterrence paradigm on the one hand, and the ability of the international community on the other hand to actually categorically reject nuclear weapons as instrument of policy and coercion. <clears throat> now, risk reduction, obviously hugely important at the moment and much discussed, including in the NPT context. So for non-nuclear weapon states, I think the 150 plus majority, it's the humanitarian consequences of nuclear explosions that are the risks to which they too are exposed to against their will and outside their control. So they want to see nuclear risk reduced by taking nuclear weapons as far away from any use or accident as possible. And obviously the elimination of nuclear weapons is the risk reduction gold standard from that perspective. But in addition to that, this would mean taking measures such as de-alerting, detargeting, taking weapons out of operational status, no first use commitments, uh, among others. But nuclear weapon states, by contrast, give dominance to strategic risk reduction, which on the one hand is a broader concept, and on the other hand, it's a narrower concept, which is understood as countering risks that could undermine nuclear deterrence relationships. So consequently, this focus makes nuclear deterrence, this focus is to make nuclear deterrence work less risky, rather than consider the risks of the practice of nuclear deterrence itself. And this limits, of course, the range of risk reduction measures that can be taken. Measures that restrict the ability to use nuclear weapons, to always use nuclear weapons such as the ones that non-nuclear weapon states would advocate, are not supported because they are assessed as having a negative impact on the always readiness to use these weapons and therefore on the credibility of nuclear deterrence. Risk reduction measures are thus considered only insofar as they do not impact the nuclear deterrence calculus, leaving aside that nuclear deterrence itself is the origin of nuclear risks. And I think this demonstrates an inherent contradiction, namely the perceived necessity to maintain nuclear weapons in a manner that demonstrates readiness and resolve to always use them as is required for the credibility of nuclear weapons and a more comprehensive approach to address nuclear risks aimed at ensuring that they will never be used intentionally or, un or unintentionally through human or technical error. So nuclear deterrence limits um, the nuclear risk, the approach to uh, limit nuclear risks. 
And thirdly, support for the disarmament and non-proliferation regime, which I think is very important at the moment, uh, as we see a fracturing of all these uh, uh, treaties and multilateral institutions. Um, so this third element, uh, a recommitment to that, um, I think the other prospects look equally bleak. The future of uh, nuclear arms control and the uh, future of disarmament efforts is equally conditioned by nuclear deterrence. I just want to point out that, uh, that uh, the breakdown of arms control is actually in contradiction to the NPT. Article 6 requires um, nuclear armed states to engage in negotiations to end arms race and achieve nuclear disarmament. Um, so the overarching conditionality was again obvious in the recent NPT review conference. Russia, of course, blocked the outcome document, but what was on the table for adoption was deeply disappointing for the non-nuclear majority of states. I think nuclear weapon states are not ready to conceptualize nuclear disarmament and the implementation of Article 6 in any other way than as an aspirational goal to be achieved in a distant future, in a distant future security environment when nuclear weapons may not be needed. But there are no credible plans of how to actually achieve this goal. All steps that are talked about, all disarmament steps that are talked about in the NPT context are qualified by the need to maintain nuclear deterrence, which in practice means and has meant now for many decades that no progress is being made. And I think this is what undermines the NPT and profoundly damages it. There are of course differences among the nuclear weapon states. It's not correct to say they're all the same, with some being more engaged, some being more transparent, and clearly the US is the most transparent of the nuclear weapon states. Um, but the general approach, I would say, is still by all the nuclear weapon states to manage the NPT process, to manage the status quo, and to prevent any measure that would actually demonstrate readiness to move away from reliance on nuclear weapons. So the urgency that non-nuclear weapon states have expressed over and over again, and would like to see translated into leadership, is not translated at all in the NPT. So, I just want, I think I conclude now by just asking the question how, which I think is the question that non-nuclear weapon states have on their mind mostly, how long do we continue to assume that nuclear deterrence will hold and that nuclear weapons and nuclear conflict will not happen? We see Russia playing Russian roulette at the moment. But how can we be confident that this is not uh, going wrong in the future, in future tensions or current tensions with China, with the DPRK, between India and Pakistan, or in a potential Middle East proliferation context? Can we actually consider this as a realist approach to continue to place our bets on deterrent stability? Or is it maybe not something more like wishful thinking belief in the stability of nuclear deterrence that may actually be based on rather flimsy evidence on many assumptions and uncertainties and on the risk of confirmation bias. So the, the, the approach of trying to find the normative and the political way out of this paradigm is urgent, but it also strikes me as actually realist because it is based on empirical evidence and the prudent response to this empirical uh, knowledge that we have on the consequences that would happen should the high risk nuclear deterrence bet fail. And now to conclude briefly on the TPNW, which I think codifies the delegitimization of nuclear weapons because of their unacceptable humanitarian impact and risks. But this is based, as I said, not on a sort of peace movement approach, but it is based on serious evidence around the consequences and risks of nuclear weapons. And it is, it is a way, and I think it's actually a 
most promising way to help the international community to help to conceptualize the necessary change of paradigm and change of perspective on these weapons. Because ultimately no responsible state should ever find the use of this most indiscriminate and destructive weapon acceptable. And obviously the same must go for the threat of use. So the TPNW, I'm not overselling the TPNW. The TPNW is not, a, is, is not the answer. It's, it's not a silver bullet for all the current and future security challenges. But I think the belief in nuclear deterrence is most definitely also not a silver bullet. And it's certainly not a sustainable one. So we need leadership and we need cooperation to, and we need a shared understanding of wanting to move out of this paradigm. And I think the TPNW is a constructive and serious investment into international law and uh, collective security. So irrespective of different legal views that one may have on the TPNW, I think it's about time that all responsible states engage constructively on the profound arguments and on the empirical evidence that has been gathered that is very impressive and very cogent. And that expresses the global security concerns um, and that are now encapsulated in the TPNW. So um, I think the, the um, if there is a shared objective to achieve nuclear disarmament and the world without nuclear weapons, we, this can only be achieved together, of course, um, by trying to find a, find a way out of this uh, precarious security paradigm. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, uh, Alexander. It was really truly uh, uh, exceptionally eloquent uh, uh, presentation. Caitlin, is Jake Sullivan on the call here? I don't know if I'm going to give him a... Whom, no, I'm just joking here. But, oh. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but, but perhaps we do have some... Uh, you know, uh, <laughs> representatives from the nuclear weapons states or, or former senior officials, if, if they would like to speak, I, I'm pleased to uh, to recognize them. And I, I'm sure at some point during our uh, our conversation, uh, you know, Sig will probably want to uh, weigh in, although he's going to be very modest. And uh, but I, I think we can I could easily generate uh, I think an interesting discussion. But before I, I do call upon. Um, you know, SIG or the others, I don't know, how many people actually of the list you sent me are, do we have actually on so the- So we have, we have 14 um, attendees online. Okay, mm -hmm. is Tom one of them or mm -hmm. he is? So he's heard it. So okay. I'm gonna, maybe I'm gonna do this uh, just to be provocative. Can we, uh, Tom, countryman, uh, no, <laughs> no longer a former very senior US government official. Uh, but, uh, and now the uh, chair of the board of the Arms Control Association, um, would you care to give uh, uh, any kind of uh, comments in your current capacity, or if you want to put back on, if you can remember what it was like to be uh, <laughs> a very senior U.S. government official, I would be pleased to give you an opportunity to weigh in before we open it up for further discussion. Tom, are you there? I can't see you, but... Uh, he may just have wanted to have a quiet afternoon. And now you... <laughs> we were just together last week, so I, I know he, he's not shy about uh, speaking out. You know and... I'm very... Um, um, <laughs> okay, Tom, Tom Phil, please. You, know, you both know I'm very shy. Um, <laughs> why my camera is not on. Um, give me a couple minutes to uh, think. Um, about what I'd like to say, um, and I enjoyed and agree so much with what Alexander has said, but uh, give me a minute to see if I have anything that's worth adding, but let some other people contribute for a moment. Okay, okay, Tom, we, we will re, uh, recall your uh, readiness to speak. This is very, very rare, by the way. I don't think I've ever heard Tom Countryman shy away as he tries to uh, collect his thoughts, uh, but... Uh, We'll give him a, a few minutes in any case. Who would like to uh, to break the ice here and to uh, comment, ask questions? And please, I mean, our our students who are here, uh, I would look particularly uh, favorably upon any questions or comments that you might uh, wish to uh, 
to raise. Anybody, please, I mean, I don't want to be the first to ask uh, questions, though I certainly am, am prepared to, uh, to do so. Anybody, this is most unusual. This is probably Tom's influence here. Everybody's going to try. Philip. Sure. Uh, he's, not, um, he's not one of our students, but uh, uh, he's, no, he's not, young uh, as, a, as a faculty member. So Philip Blake, do you want to? Yeah, so I'm on the faculty here. And I think we last met in 2010 at a lunch that Bill organized at the NPC Review Conference in New York. Um, and you said something there that was maybe trying to be a little provocative, but that really stuck with me. And I'd be really curious to hear you reflect on it. So you said at the time, um, if the United States, and these are not your exact words, so these are just my characterization. Um, if the United States and the other nuclear armed states don't begin to take nuclear disarmament more seriously, Austria will need to revisit its own stance on nuclear weapons. Um, and that's, again, that's not an exact quote. And I think you were probably trying to be a little bit provocative, but I'd be really interested, you know, a dozen years have passed since then. I think we probably agree that the United States and the other nuclear armed states, as you just indicated, haven't in fact made much progress and if anything have regressed. Um, and I would be really curious to hear your reflections on how the Austrian conversation has evolved over that time period. And again, you were probably being provocative and I just sort of quasi quoted you and it occurs to me right now, maybe I should have asked permission to do that because that was a lunch conversation. It was certainly not only on the record. And this is being um, recorded. So and this is being recorded. Feel any so feel free to say whatever seems appropriate, but it's just, it really stuck with me. And I'd be genuinely curious to hear you reflect on it now, 12 years later. You, you want a few seconds to respond? No, no, no. <laughs> no, no, no. It's actually a very easy question because um, it wasn't me. <laughs> it was another Austrian Alexander, it was Axel, Axel Marsch. Oh, Alexander, in, uh, ah, in 2010, yeah, so I'm, oh, I'm extremely, I mean, so I've sort of blended you in my head. Yeah. <laughs> I'm, highly confident. I'm extremely impressed so that you remember what anybody said 12 years ago. <laughs> I certainly don't remember what I said 12 years ago, but I know that I wasn't at the 2010 okay. review conference okay. because I was working at the CTPTO at the time. But Axel Marschik, okay. who had my current job at the time, yep. Yep. and he was chair of the sub subsidiary body uh, one. one. So he was a uh, pen holder of the 2010 action plan yeah. part on the nuclear disarmament side. And uh, um, that was a great responsibility and very important that it actually is even more important now because it's the last uh, consensus document that we have in the NPT context. But the whole approach of the, of the action plan was to essentially give some momentum to the NPT's disarmament aspect by moving away from aspirational language to have something benchmarks, measurable, time bound, and so on. And of course it wasn't possible yeah? because the NPT 2010 action plan is again, essentially aspirational language. And what sounds like concrete measures is in fact heavily qualified as I've tried to point out with references or hidden references to nuclear deterrence and the need to qualify every step with nuclear chance. And what Axel meant at the time, so it's easy for me to answer the question yes. because it wasn't my own word, but uh, uh, it's, it's, it's uh, the NPT needs to get its act to NPT nuclear weapon states and the NPT as a treaty framework needs to get its act together nuclear disarmament. Uh, so that's why I pushed for the action plan. And that's why we wanted to have benchmarks and timelines and all of this. Because if this if this doesn't happen, the NPT will be profoundly damaged and and will lose support. And what and um, uh, and 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 uh, um, what was meant at the time is that we have to look for additional uh, measures, legal measures, to give uh, um, more focus. And out of this emerged a humanitarian initiative out of which then emerged the TPNW. So, I mean, of course, I cannot fully interpret what he said, but I think it's probably the... the... Let me answer the question in, in a different way. I'm aware of the limitations of the TPNW. It's not the preferred way of pushing for nuclear disarmament. It emerged because all everything else had been tried. It emerged because every other avenue was blocked. Conference on Disarmament being blocked for 
25, for more than 25 years, NPT not delivering credible progress, CTPT not entering into force. So all these, all, all the, all the avenues that non-nuclear weapon states have, have been blocked or unsuccessful. So the TPNW emerged as the one thing that the non-nuclear majority of countries can take is essentially norm creation, norm uh, entrepreneurship, uh, trying to um, trying to regain some agency through this approach. So I think that's that's you know yeah. But, but it's also I think you know relevant to the the discussion is that the nuclear weapons states and other nuclear weapons possessors that are not recognized by the NPT as nuclear weapon states did have an opportunity to participate uh, in the open-ended working group, which could really set the stage for the uh, negotiation of the TPNW. And none of them chose to participate. And I think that's why we ended up with the TPNW, uh, which was not really foreordained. There could have been other approaches uh, that you know might have uh, come out of that open-ended working group had nuclear weapon states uh, engaged. Uh, who would also, who would like to ask the next uh, question? Thank you, Philip, for sure. bringing it. Masako, you went, and just because we, I don't know if it's, you know, on the, uh, who's participating virtually, and uh, not everybody here may know who you are also. Do you want to just identify yourself and then uh, ask uh, Thank you so Ambassador? Much, Ambassador. I, I must say I'm a big fan of you. <laughs> also, I'm also a strong supporter of the TPNW, but I also saw that, that they said the TPNW was the only option that was left for them. And that was a very strong dilemma I also had. So, now we see the situation like a world is polarized, TPNW supporter and uh, a vicarious advocate. And uh, I was originally thinking this humanitarian approach is something that could uh, build a stronger bridge uh, between vicarious advocates and the TPNW advocates. And um, I understand that, you know, uh, none of uh, and the weapon states actually, so with the exception of the uh, Vienna Conference, the US uh, and the some, some nuclear weapon states joined, but uh, they didn't uh, you know, contribute to the productive discussion, but constructive discussion. So, my question is uh, I think uh, this is my like a perennial question, but uh, currently, when we see the situation, this normative approach we are advocating, the armament advocate is really advocating, is not really working. Or, not really touching a deterrence advocate's heart or a mindset. So how, how can we like uh, narrow the bridge or is it even possible? But yeah, thank you. Thank you very much, Osako. First, my first point would be that it's part of the, in my view, politically motivated narrative to accuse the TPNW of polarization. Because the the division on nuclear weapons has always been there. Um, uh, it's just been brushed over. Uh, it's it's uh, or it's not been possible for non-nuclear weapon states uh, to to really have their say in the treaty frameworks in which we operate because we operate there on the basis of consensus. So what comes out is. Uh, negotiated outcome. But the views that are now encapsulated in the TPNW have not emerged at the time of the TPNW. They, they, have, they, they are part of the nuclear weapons history. The difference is, is that now they are enshrined in a legal instrument, uh, which was negotiated and pushed through on the basis of rules of procedure of the General Assembly, which means you can vote which means it couldn't be stopped because the majority of states has the majority in the General Assembly. And I think that is a huge part of the contestation around the TPNW because everything around nuclear weapons has been controlled by the countries that have these weapons. Essentially, I think the nuclear weapons debate and the NPT are an extension of the UN Security Council in many ways even though the nuclear weapon status has nothing to do really with the Security Council permanent membership. So the, the fact that the majority of nuclear have-nots 
takes these steps, thereby um, getting agency and reducing the control that, uh, or challenging the control that nuclear weapon states have over the nuclear weapons discourse is a huge part of the contestation, but not from the TPNW side, but from the side of those who see their control being challenged. I think that's the first thing. The second thing, the, the, um, the humanitarian, the focus on the humanitarian consequences obviously must be a shared concern and must be bridge building. Um, so I think it is now used um, as an argument that this is too closely linked to the TPNW and that's why some states don't want to talk about I think this is also politically motivated because in reality, what is the con what is at the end of the conversation about humanitarian consequences is the challenge to nuclear deterrence. And at the end of it is the necessary recognition that nuclear armed states uh, preference the maintenance of nuclear deterrence over the security, the potential security con, con, concerns of the non-nuclear majority who would end up as collateral damage because there aren't any answers. Obviously, if nuclear deterrence fails, obviously these states would also end up as collateral damage. And this is a conversation that is of course extremely uncomfortable because it raises all these issues. So the argument of the politicization and the non-engaging in bridge building I think is not is not uh, the responsibility of the non-nuclear majority who makes these points, which they have made over decades. It's actually part of the of the of the challenge and of the significance of the challenge of the TPW. And uh, lastly, it's not working. Well, we've only just started. Yeah? I mean, it's 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 uh, it's. Uh, it's uh, it's a treaty in its infancy. It's it's uh, it's uh, um, it's the new kid on the block. I think it has had some significant impact. It has its limitations, of course. Yeah, it's it's a tall order to 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 uh, to explain the val the validity of a treaty prohibiting a category of weapons when those countries that have the weapons don't want to have any, anything to do with it. Of course, it's difficult. But as I said, it was the one thing that was that was left to do. And the TPNW works on the legal plane. And of course, it's legally binding for states that ratify it, but it also works on the political plane. And I think that's probably where the impact, or at least the potential impact in the countries that have these weapons or in the countries that rely on these weapons, where it has a chance. Because the more we the more we make the arguments about the consequences and risks, the more uh, the veracity around nuclear deterrence might be challenged. And I think, how do we achieve change? I think part of the problem is is that the nuclear weapons discourse, certainly in Western countries, has been essentially for many years now since the Cold War, essentially been limited to a very small security policy expert circle. It's essentially a nuclear bubble. It's full of, full of uh, acronyms. It's very difficult. Uh, most people don't pay attention to it. Most people until President Putin re reminded us otherwise have thought it's a, it's a distant issue. It has something to do with DPRK maybe or uh, Iran. Now suddenly it's back in the forefront. Uh, so I think that's, that's probably the one good thing about what, 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 uh, what we can say about uh, President Putin's uh, action there, is that he's sort of brought the issue back. But, but uh, um, so it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a discursive process and the TPNW works on the legal dimension and probably has limitations there. But the arguments that underpin it are extremely profound and they're very hard to dismiss, I think. So they, they are being dismissed and they can continue to be dismissed until we succeed that these issues are debated much more broadly because that is the conditionality in my view, how we will ever change this issue is if we have much broader 
societal discourse on this issue and in a way take it out of the of the very narrow uh, circle of, of experts that are talking this issue uh, now. Thank, thank you, Alexander. I see that Tom has now had time to collect his thoughts. So we wait with bated breath, Tom. No, please breathe, please. <laughs> um, well, thank you very much. And uh, thank you, Alexander, both for today and for speaking to us at uh, our annual meeting of the Arms Association last month. I know that Jake Sullivan was honored to be on the same platform as you. Um, <laughs> three quick points. Um, first, I've always admired the impetus and the effort to uh, negotiate the treaty prohibition of nuclear weapons. Like any other multilateral treaty, it's an imperfect instrument. It contains compromises that somewhat weaken the primary point of the treaty, uh, but it is still extremely valuable as an expression, as Alexander said, of the determination of non-nuclear weapon states not to be uh, impotent onlookers as uh, the actions of nuclear weapon states uh, threaten the security of the planet. Um, and I hope I had something to do both inside and in my, in my temporary return to the State Department and outside in getting the US administration to tone down its criticism. There is no need for the US to imitate Moscow or other nuclear states in uh, savaging the treaty. Uh, I do think that the most important developments in the next couple of years are not whether the TPNW gains additional adherence, it's whether the nuclear weapon states themselves recognize the very difficult situation that we are in now. In that sense, I view the TPNW as a uh, long range, important effort to lessen nuclear risks, but that the, uh, the real steps that are necessary at this moment have to come from those five states themselves. Um, the second point is just, um, again, I, I like, Alexander's rhetoric, and I always like to remind audiences that rhetoric matters. The way you talk is as important as what you keep in your pocket. Um, and in that sense, I think that Jake Sullivan's speech to us was appropriate in terms of recognizing the dangers of this moment and of making the statement that we need to be talking with both Russia and China separately, not together, uh, at this particular moment without preconditions. I have to say, and I've, I've let the drafters of the speech know, uh, that I'm disappointed that we didn't hear a lot of the positive rhetoric that we've heard from so many uh, former administrations, in fact, pretty much from every administration except one. Uh, and that is to talk about our commitment to Article 6 of the NPT and the need for good faith negotiations as a legal obligation of the U.S. government, uh, to say the word disarmament, and to say that we have a goal of a world without nuclear weapons. Uh, to hear those things from this administration as we've heard from previous administrations uh, sends a positive message of what motivates us rather than simply our back is against the wall at this particular moment of tension, therefore we have to negotiate. So it was the right offer, the right way forward, uh, <clears throat> but I would have liked to see it accompanied by the kind of rhetoric that previous presidents have used to motivate the effort. Uh, third quick comment is about 
deterrence. And again, I appreciate your work, Alexander, to try to define alternative approaches <clears throat> besides nuclear deterrence. Um, and I don't think the primary problem of achieving that is because political leaders are determined to defend their privilege of owning nuclear weapons. <laughs> I think there's uh, two problems. One, it is not easy to define an alternative universe in which deterrence is not necessary. Uh, and two, and here's perhaps where I most disagree with you, deterrence works. That is, it works until it doesn't, which is why we are in need of new theories and new thinking. Uh, but the historical fact from most readings by most people is that deterrence has so far uh, prevented the temptation on the part of any of the nuclear powers to use their weapons. Uh, is this an ideal situation? No, because it is far from a perfect theory. It is far from a guarantee that these weapons will never be used. And as you point out, uh, Mr. Putin has reminded us of this fact just in the last year. Uh, but the historical record makes it difficult to simply dismiss deterrence as a concept. So those are my little comments. Uh, I think we need to keep searching for an alternative model, and I appreciate the work that you're doing on that. Um, I'll stop there. Thank you again for uh, doing this with C both in Monterey and in Mexico. Cheers. Yeah. Thank, thanks so much, Tom. Uh, Alexander, do you want to uh, respond at this point? Or? Yes, yes. Uh, thank you, Tom. Uh, sorry for making you listen to uh, similar points uh, twice in the course of four weeks. Thanks a lot for your, for your very good, as always, comments. In, in fact, I have, I, have, uh, I have very little I, I disagree with. Uh, um, I, in a way, agree with everything you, you said. I, I think I also look at the TPW as a long range effort. These are your your words. I think that's a, that's that's a good way of describing it. Yeah? It's it's. A, um, I also think that there should be more emphasis of the D word, <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, which which, uh, and on the on the um, on the deterrence point, I think the 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 key. The key is actually how little we really know for sure uh, on both sides of the argument. And I sort of tried to try to make this point. You you said it works until it doesn't work, which is which is true, but it's not it's not different uh, to what I said. It's just it's very hard to make the positive proof for nuclear deterrence having worked and having been the one decisive factors for specific actions or non-actions when there are plenty of other factors that are in play as well. But the point I think still stands that at least from the perspective of the non-nuclear majority and the fact that um, consequences would mean serious collateral damage, that the, it works until it doesn't work is not reassuring enough and therefore just underscores the point for a serious effort of moving out of this paradigm. And I would make the point that this effort can be probably instigated or pushed by the non-nuclear majority, but I agree entirely that it has, of course, has to come from the states that have these weapons. And I think if we are in a situation where risks are higher than they've been in decades, where we in a way come full circle again, where we see a uh, very dangerous nuclear arms race and arms race dynamics in general um, uh, happening in front of our eyes, where we have to say that obviously our efforts over the past decades, as sincere as they were, were not sufficiently successful, that this change of paradigm is very urgent. And I would make the case that who, 
who should be leading this effort? It's obviously, in my view, it cannot, I mean, it can be instigated by the non-nuclear majority, but surely it should come from, from probably the most powerful actors. And I am not seeing from NATO any debate that would indicate even the readiness to debate getting out of this paradigm, quite the opposite. We see a re-emphasis on nuclear deterrence uh, uh, there as well, understandable in the face of the problems that are out there. But of course, it creates a huge tension with, uh, with, uh, uh, with the treaty obligations, and it perpetuates uh, um, the situation that we're in. So who other than who other than, than led by the US and the most powerful military alliance should lead a discussion process actually trying to move out of this paradigm. So the non-nuclear, yes, we can push and we can make our points, uh, uh, but uh, um, the leadership really must come from elsewhere. Thank you, Alexander. Uh, I see uh, our distinguished professor of practice, uh, Dr. Hecker has his hand up here. I mean, and I, let me, I'm gonna call upon Sig in just a moment. I mean, there are no more eloquent speakers than the ones you've already heard uh, today, but I don't want that to be a deterrent from all of the other faculty, member, for faculty members and students and, and colleagues to, to take uh, the floor. And I, I'm saying that very sincerely. Uh, so Sig, I give you uh, an opportunity to weigh in. This may be a, a dress rehearsal for Mexico City next week where the two of you will have an opportunity to continue this discussion, but uh, you have the floor. Well, thank you, uh, Bill. Indeed, I was going to wait, Alexander, until uh, we uh, are on the same program in Mexico City uh, on, on this issue, just being one of those uh, that is the treaty. Uh, I will be there only uh, virtually uh, from here in, in Santa Fe. But, but let me just uh, thank you for your presentation. And, and I must say, to sort of speak up uh, in any sort of way to criticize Alexander is pretty difficult because in the end, I mean, his goal is noble. You know, he's doing the work of God. And so almost if you speak up against him and this whole issue that somewhere along the line, you know, we should indeed uh, disarm from a nuclear standpoint. That's pretty difficult to do. Uh, but uh, Tom Countryman made uh, my job uh, a lot easier because he made uh, many of the key points in sort of around the periphery and then focusing it also uh, what's the most immediate uh, uh, concern. And there, I would just sort of uh, piggyback uh, on Tom's comment that right, right now, uh, the actions uh, of uh, the five nuclear weapons states, uh, those are really the most important. And then particularly, I mean, you can limit it further uh, and say the three, uh, you know, United States, uh, Russia, and China. And so what strikes me there uh, is the, the difficult geopolitical problems we have right now, uh, and, and they are in, indeed very, very difficult and of great concerns. Uh, these are not driven by nuclear things at all. You know, if you look at Putin's actions, and I've been reading Philip Short's biography of Putin, which just, by the way, is just fantastic. And it shows as we come up to the time of First Crimea and, and now in the last year and a half, sort of Putin is sort of playing out on the accumulation of grievances, you know, against the United States of America. And at least for the most part, most of those grievances aren't, aren't in the nuclear arena. They are all of the other things. And so uh, the nuclear part certainly comes in as to how things will play out. And of course, that's what we're worried right now in Ukraine. And I think in a very similar sense, the situation with China is also similar. It's not the nuclear stuff that drives things. It's these other issues. And so unless we can come to grips with those, it's sort of difficult you know, to turn the attention uh, uh, to the treaty and, and the issue uh, of nuclear disarmament. So th that's one comment. The second comment uh, is, uh, as Bill, as, as you know, and the uh, 
uh, certainly the people at, at CNS know, because I've talked about this before, that, that you know, my, my focus, my personal focus now for many years has been to avoid the use of nuclear weapons or accidental detonation to use it, uh, you know, to avoid any nuclear detonation uh, on mushroom cloud. Uh, and so what to me is really important is, is what I call this global nuclear order. I see Jeffrey Knopf there, you know, he's written about it uh, very eloquently. And so uh, I've really focused on my focus on the global nuclear order. And when Putin invaded Ukraine, uh, what struck me then is, of course, we need to worry about, is he going to use nuclear weapons? But more importantly, he blew up the global nuclear order, in my opinion. And, and for the global nuclear order, Alexander, if we could get the world to think more about these broader terms, and in the global nuclear order, what I work towards is that I actually, unlike the Austrians, even though I spent my youth in Austria, like the Austrians, I think there are good things that come with nuclear. Nuclear energy, yeah, you know, it, it really pains me uh, that Austria is so anti-nuclear energy, but nuclear energy, nuclear medicine, those are the positive parts. And it takes the world to work together to get it so that we can do something about, you know, cleaner environment, global climate change, et cetera. And then along with those benefits, you have to weigh those against the risks of things nuclear. You know, so nuclear weapons use. Well, you know, global nuclear order, we haven't had any use. And as you've pointed out so nicely, you know, well, deterrent uh, doesn't necessarily have to work forever. But the second part is nuclear proliferation. It is limit the number of countries that actually have their fingers on, on nuclear. <clears throat> and it, it takes the world. It's not just the P5 or the other states that have nuclear. It takes the whole world to work together to make sure that there's less proliferation. It's not just the nuclear proliferation treaty. It's the whole regime that, that's important. And then comes nuclear terrorism. And again, for to, to avoid nuclear terrorism, it takes a world. It takes the non-nuclear weapon states. It takes the nuclear weapon states. We have to work together. And, and I can sense you know, that if anything, that the TPNW didn't cause us not to work together. But sure, from what I've seen, it hasn't helped us to join, at least in my drive. Let me stop there. OK. Uh, thanks. Uh, thanks very much, uh, Sagan. We'll have opportunities to continue the discussion uh, next week. Are, are there other people on the call? Yeah, so um, Haya Kim has written um, some questions in the chat, and then we also have Spencer and Sophia. Okay, so um, I also want to encourage those of you who are in the room to uh, raise your hand so I can. How does that work? Pardon? Okay, so let me take, um, since I can't see them and I may forget them, let me ask for uh, relatively brief. Uh, questions or comments uh, from who are the, you said? Sophia, um, Hank is first, and then we have Spencer and then Sophia. Okay, so if we can have uh, the three people uh, who are uh, uh, not present here, uh, I can only see Spencer, but I, I, Sophia, and who, if they would like to ask their questions, why don't we take the three of them and let you respond to those three? And then we'll turn to uh, folks in the room, including Professor Cohen, but not first. So uh, let's just take those three. Um, so my question is to, uh, to what extent do you think maybe establishment of the international legally binding and on the conditional negative security assurance arrangement, I mean, to what extent it could be uh, beneficial to achieving global non-proliferation and disarmament objective okay. Also, do you think what would be the practical step toward it? And there's certain conversation about this topic, but I was wondering whether what is your view on the impact of the US extended nuclear deterrence in the context of the achieving the international NSA arrangement? Thanks. Look, I'll turn to now Spencer and then Sophia. And if you just, I encourage you to ask one question rather than multiple questions just given our time constraints here. Sure, mine is just one, and I just want to uh, thank the ambassador. Ben, did you want to, to introduce yourself to just for purposes? Sure, so sure, sure. sure. Um, so, hi, Ambassador. It's a pleasure um, to be able to listen to you. 
Uh, I work here at CNS as a graduate research assistant. Um, I actually, uh, John Dupree is my boss. Um, and so I'm not here because of him, I'm here because of you, don't worry. Um, but I wanna thank you personally because it's actually two years ago today that I was stuck in the Denver airport for a six hour delay um, and your book, uh, got me through that six-hour delay. So I have you to thank for not losing my mind in that six-hour delay. Um, but, but my question is, what matters more, the product or the process? And I'll clarify what I mean by that. Um, does the product of nuclear disarmament matter more than the process by which it matters, in your opinion? So if nuclear disarmament occurs bilaterally outside of the NPT process, or even trilaterally outside of the NPT process, et cetera, um, is that more important to the, new, to the non-nuclear weapon states, to uh, groups like ICANN, to TPNW states parties, than if nuclear disarmament took place within the NPT process, within the global uh, nuclear non-proliferation regime process writ large, um, but it took longer or it actually didn't go anywhere like it is today. Um, so it's more, I guess, of a philosophical question um, on how, you know, supporters of the TPNW uh, view progress on disarmament. Thank you. Thanks, Spencer. Uh, Sophie, we'll turn to you and then uh, I'll let Alexander respond to the questions and we'll go back to the audience in Monterey. And you want to just introduce yourself too. Absolutely. So I'm Sophia Boti, and I work in the CNS DC office. Um, and I, uh, Master Grant, we last spoke at the Carnegie Conference where I talked your ear off about gender and the TPNW. So I won't ask you about that question again. Um, but to try to make <laughs> this very short, um, I want to follow up on a few things you said about the TPNW not being the silver bullet, but neither are current policies on nuclear deterrence and how. The approach, at least from some nuclear weapon states currently towards disarmament is to treat it as an aspirational goal. And I'm very interested to hear your perspective on trying to thread that needle um, and really to hear your perspective as someone who has worked in this field for a fair amount of time and has watched the ebb and flow of nuclear risks, but also seen this lack of progress towards this lack of progress towards progress on Article 6. Really, my question is, do you see a path? When you think about working towards disarmament, is there a path that you see a specific sort of step by step or a path for new government states to take that attitude shift? Or are you sort of just as in the dark and just trying to make progress on this wherever there are opportunities as sort of the rest of us? Um, but yeah, is there a path that you're thinking of? And if I can add just a very brief part two, um, I believe that as the former president of the first meeting of state parties for the TPW, you're on that TPW coordination committee. Um, so I'd also add on um, if you could speak to how the coordination committee is approaching this question in their work during the intersessional period. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Sophia. Alexander, as briefly as yeah. you can. Yeah. <laughs> um, thank you very much. All very, very good, challenging questions. Uh, if I could respond briefly to the uh, comments of uh, Dr. Heck. Uh, uh, I don't find myself disagreeing with what you what you say. Of course, geopolitics uh, is driving these developments, and it's not dominated or dictated by nuclear weapons, but they are a significant aspect of it. And it's a matter of perspective, I think, that as I tried to point out, if you if you look at this issue from the non-nuclear majority of states, uh, it's very disconcerting. Um, I agree entirely with the focus to avoid the use of nuclear weapons. And uh, there I would say that in my view, the TPNW is a very significant con contribution to it through the stigmatization uh, effort, through the focus on the humanitarian consequences, uh, through the focus of um, trying to raise the bar against uh, nuclear weapons use. And I would add, because you specifically highlighted non-proliferation, I think uh, the contribution of the TPNW or the approach to underscore the unacceptability of nuclear weapons use is a powerful non-proliferation measure as well. It contributes, it raises the bar. Uh, so I think it's something that has been 
underrated in the in the discussion uh, um, uh, on the on the on on the TPNW that it is a contribution to non-proliferation. So I agree entirely with all the uh, with the focus that you say on maintaining the nuclear order, uh, the regime, uh, nuclear terrorism, all of that. And I think it's it's an expression of 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 agency and commitment by the non-nuclear majority. It's an investment into international law and into the nuclear order. Uh, on the very challenging question on the impact of extended nuclear deterrence on binding negative security assurances, I, I'm going to give it a pass for the moment because I think I need to think about this. I, 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 I don't want to. I don't want to improvise an answer uh, there. Um, Spencer's question on what's more important, outcome or process? Uh, um, or how, how do the TPNW states parties uh, uh, see this? I mean, the nuclear disarmament process, of course, is extremely important in any case in terms of confidence building measures, in terms of talking. But I think from the perspective of the um, of TPNW states parties or the non-nuclear majority, it actually doesn't matter at all in which framework progress is achieved. Uh, it's it's, uh, it's uh, uh, the most important thing is material progress on those issues. Uh, and if it's in the NPT, fine. If it's in the TPNW, fine. If it's bilateral, fine. Uh, that's, that's not the key issue. Um, this is recorded, so I have to be careful with what I say. But uh, um, even if some states don't join the TPNW, if it's if it creates pressure, urgency for states to take concrete steps, that's a good thing. Yeah. So I, I we 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 don't see this material progress and any form in which progress uh, takes place at the moment is, is a good thing. And in a way that's sort of partly the answer to Sophie's questions as well. Um, I think, first of all, we actually haven't seen nuclear disarmament. We've seen arms control. Um, and I think there is, a, there is a conceptual difference between what we actually mean by nuclear disarmament how I think the vast majority of countries sees it and how the approach that we've seen so far. We have seen an arms control approach. We have seen the reduction and destruction of nuclear weapons predominantly based on obsolescence and the arms control and arms reduction treaties that we have seen are of course hugely important, no question there, but they are underpinned by the necessity of maintaining nuclear weapons and strategic stability. I think nuclear disarmament is only possible when the security value that is attributed to nuclear weapons um, changes. So we haven't seen that yet. And of course, from an arms control perspective, the lower you go down with numbers, the more important uh, and the more challenging it becomes. But if we are successful with the conceptual switch that actually it's an unacceptable construct in the first place, any use is irresponsible. Any threat of use is irresponsible. The whole calculation behind nuclear weapons as a guarantee of security is questionable. I think that is the path to make the conceptual switch that's, necess that's necessary to actually achieve this element that I'm talking about. So I think that's of course hugely difficult and it only works one conversation at a time, <coughs> but, but, uh, but uh, um, we haven't seen that readiness yet. Yeah? And that's why I say nuclear disarmament for the moment is conceptualized only as an aspirational goal. I do believe that all the nuclear weapon states would like to see a world without nuclear weapons. But it's in the sense that it would be better if we live in a world without 
nuclear weapons. It's not actually, um, or it's, but we have these weapons. These weapons do exist. That's why we don't know how to get out of this paradigm. So I, 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 I think that's that's the fundamental challenge. And of course, it's hugely difficult. And we're only at the beginning, and we haven't made sufficient headway there. But if you ask me for a path, for a credible path, then I think it's that that takes away takes away the 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 the. Um, the value that's attributed to nuclear weapons. And lastly, you asked about the coordination committee. I mean, I, uh, uh, the implementation of the TPNW, as I said, it's a young treaty. We've only had a little more than a year ago, the first meeting of states parties where we've taken um, the first set of decisions in terms of implementing the treaty. We've established informal working groups and there is a coordinating committee uh, that uh, tries to coordinate this. There are, of course, huge resource limitations in, in, in the TPNW. Uh, the vast majority of countries are, uh, are, are developing countries with, with uh, little human resources, little financial resources. So we don't have an institution or a secretariat. It's a membership-driven process. Uh, so we have to have individuals in states parties ready to take on responsibility so that makes it very difficult and 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 uh, challenging so some of the implementation work uh, will be slower some will be faster but i think we've 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 taken the necessary decision to demonstrate that states parties want to work towards the implementation of the treaty uh, and want to increase the membership of the treaty. So I think in that sense, it's uh, working well with all the limitations and challenging uh, challenges that we have. Thank you, Alexander. <clears throat> you know, if we had more time, uh, I would weigh in on the arms control disarmament discussion and we'll do that maybe uh, over lunch. Mm -hmm. And I think Avner will also have an opportunity to weigh in and ask his questions and, and discuss things with you later this afternoon. So I, I will, since we're really close to the uh, the moment we have to conclude our discussion, I saw there were two, Tricia and, okay, okay the two of you uh, have the, uh, the last word in terms of asking questions, and I'm going to give it back to Ambassador Clement to, to wrap up. I'm not sure, Tricia, you want to? Sure, mine, first? mine's quick, hopefully. Um, my name is Tricia White. I'm a recent MIS graduate turned research associate here at CNS on the new tools East Asia team. Uh, my question for you, and also maybe people online, is we've been having a lot of discussion about semantics, especially semantics surrounding the TPNW. Do you think that it's fair to characterize the treaty more as a tool rather than a regime or an institution? And do you think that nuclear weapon states would be more receptive to it if we started calling it th this tool towards disarmament rather than a regime of disarmament? If that happens, it's a difference. Hey, you'd like to introduce yeah. yourself? Yeah, yeah. Um, my name is Sean Manning. I'm an undergraduate fellow here at CNS this summer. Um, and so my question, also, first of all, thank you so much for speaking, it's a privilege to hear. Um, but my question is, just as someone who's, who's pretty young, I only became politically aware in the mid-2010s, it's been kind of a dark time to be politically aware of nuclear, you know, issues, uh, nothing, there's been some successes, obviously, but more negatives. Um, and so I kind of had this fear that if we allow this to fester over time, people in my generation will kind of see the non-proliferation regime as like, antiquated from you know the 20th century. Um, and this may be a great place to end, but how do you see the ability to reignite you know, support for and interest in non-proliferation without having some major issue or meltdown or use of a nuclear weapon? Okay, so that's a great question too. Yeah, good questions. Um, tool versus regime. Uh, I think in a way it's both. Uh, I think that's that's uh, that's clear. I said it works on the legal plane, and that's obviously for the states parties. So we are building a regime, um, and uh, uh, it. I mean, the regime that we build is based on the provisions of the treaty, and we are we are doing some of the groundworks in terms of pathways for nuclear disarmament. Should in the future uh, nuclear armed states. 
are ready to join. Yeah? So we know this is not round the corner. So we're discussing this very carefully. I think one, one, one thought that is interesting, try to imagine what nuclear disarmament would look like for a nuclear armed state that actually wants to give up its nuclear weapons because it has bought into the humanitarian and risk logic on which the TPNW is based. So it's a diff it would be a different approach. So we are, we are building this. Uh, but then another key aspect is, uh, which I didn't mention at all, is the focus on the positive obligations in the treaty, which is uh, victim assistance and environmental remediation, which is, and we actually do have several states parties whose populations are still suffering from the consequences of nuclear weapons testing. Uh, Kazakhstan, of course, the most obvious example, but some of the Pacific Island states. So we have states parties that have serious humanitarian issues related to nuclear weapons testing within the treaty. So we are building, uh, working to build a cooperative system of how to address some of those issues, in addition to some other aspects, scientific advice and so on. So for the states parties, it's a regime, uh, very clearly. And I'm the first to admit that uh, the TPW is not customary international law and not for a while. Uh, so obviously we cannot uh, impose the legal obligation on states that do not want to be bound by the treaty. But there the political dimension comes in and there it is a tool. It is a tool uh, to make the arguments on which the TPW is based, even if you disagree with the legal con conclusions of it. And that's, I think, that's a very... That's a point which is, I think, hard to argue with, because uh, the arguments on the TPW are serious arguments, certainly from the perspective of the non-nuclear majority. So you can disagree with the legal conclusions that the TPW uh, raises, but by all means, if we're really all concerned about maintaining the nuclear order and the regime, you have to get uh, engaged in a constructive way with these arguments, yeah? because otherwise, that that is that's that's the rot in the NPT is the fact that we are not engaging on those issues, at least from the perspective of the non-nuclear weapon states. We have to find a way that these perspectives are taken seriously. So I think it works both. I'm not sure that semantics as such would uh, make a big difference because I'm. I think the nuclear weapon states pretty well understand the legal and the and the political uh, aspect uh, there. And 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 uh, yes, it's easy to be despondent. Um, the good thing is, if you work in this field, you have a job security <laughs> <laughs> for a, probably for a long time because this issue will be with us for for a long time. So uh, yes, it's it's it's. I mean, I started working in the late 90s, which was the end of the golden age, so-called, and since then things have gone downhill <laughs> pretty much. Yeah? So it's, it's, uh, it's extremely, it's extremely uh, uh, hard to, to stay optimistic. But I think if you work in diplomacy or in the sort of diplomacy surrounding field, you must believe in the possibility of change, change for the better, because otherwise, you have to have a different job anyway. So uh, um, how to reignite it is, I think, um, in many ways, open the debate up to broader constituencies. Yeah? It's, it's, it's anachronistic how we talk about nuclear weapons. Yeah? Uh, uh, it's, it's not commensurate to 21st century where, where, where uh, issues are or should be debated much more broadly. It's, it's, I think it's part of a design in a way to keep the nuclear weapons debate very narrow, that it's complicated and uh, you don't understand uh, and you don't understand security and so on. So that it is, it's, it's, it's limited. I think nuclear weapons, because of, the, because of the, the, the gravity of the issue, needs to be discussed in a much more broad societal way than it is at the moment. And there I would say again, um, a really important example that I often bring is when we talk about nuclear weapons in this multilateral uh, fora, it might be difficult for some developing countries to talk about strategic stability or nuclear deterrence uh, 
intricacies. Yeah? But if you start talking about uh, uh, health impacts, food security, um, humanitarian aspects, yeah, then suddenly many more stakeholders have a lot to say about these issues. And I think that's, that's the way how we'll, how we'll get to change, is to, is to connect this issue much more broadly uh, because it's such an existential threat. The way we talk about nuclear weapons in these relatively closed circles is not commensurate to the existential risks that they represent. So they should be discussed like climate change. It's, 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 why, why, why is it that everybody talks about climate change now? I mean, experts have been warning us for decades. Now we see the Amazon burning and the islands sinking and, and drought and all of that. And suddenly we can't ignore the issue with nuclear weapons. It's more challenging because we cannot wait until we see it. Obviously, we have to we have to uh, make the we have to connect the broader societal discourse to the issue preventatively. I think that's the that's the big challenge. But I think it's it's uh, it's uh, hugely important. And what is antiquated about the regime, I think, is the way we discuss nuclear weapons in it. Yeah? It's it's still to this day you see some states blocking the access of civil society, yeah? uh, 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 making sure that, 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 uh, that uh, the role of external voices is as limited as possible. The TPNW is part of the, part of the avant-garde answer to it. We've been extremely open to it. Yeah? I think that's um, most other issues, most other issues are talked in, uh, 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 addressed in the, nowadays in a, in a, in a, in a completely different way. The nuclear debate is still a bit anachronistic in that sense. Alexander, um, you're still a young guy. You have a long diplomatic career ahead of you. But as I look at, at Sig Hecker, and I'm reminded of a, a professor of practice position that is available uh, in principle uh, at the Institute here, rather than coming for just a week, we would love to have you come back for an extended period of time. So bear that in mind. Uh, this has really been a fascinating discussion. So I want to thank you. I want to thank the audience. Uh, please join me in uh, expressing our appreciation thank to you. our very distinguished speakers.